Chapter 17, The Science of Bubbles Bubbles have proved useful in many areas of science, but only around 1900 did bubble science become a respectable field. The men responsible, however, Ernest Rutherford and Lord Kel Kelvin, William Thompson, had only vague ideas of what their work would lead to. Bubbly Inspiration Rutherford moved from New Zealand to the University of Cambridge in 1895, and he devoted himself to radioactivity. Nobody was better, possibly in the history of science, at extracting nature's secrets out of experiments. And there's no better example than the elegance he used to solve the mystery of how one element can transform into another. After moving from Cambridge to Montreal, Rutherford grew interested in how radioactive substances fill the air around them with even more radioactivity. To investigate this, Rutherford built on the work of Marie Curie. According to Curie, among others, radioactive elements leaked a sort of gas of pure radioactivity that charged the air just as light bulbs flood the air with light. Rutherford suspected that pure radioactivity was actually an unknown gaseous element with its own radioactive properties. To investigate his theory, Rutherford let nature do the work for him. He simply let a simple sample of radioactivity radioactive metal decay in a closed container, then drew bubbles of the gas into an inverted flask, a procedure that gave him all the radioactive material that he needed. Rutherford and his lab partner, Frederick Soddy, quickly proved the radioactive bubbles were in fact a new element, radon. And because the sample beneath the inverted beaker got smaller in exactly the same proportion as the radon sample grew in volume, they realized that one element actually changed into the other. Not only did Rutherford and Soddy find a new element, they discovered that as elements decayed, they could jump around the periodic table and that they could skip across boxes on the table. This change from one element into another is called transmutation. It was thrilling, but it also presented a problem. Science had spent a huge amount of time and effort discrediting those old chemical magicians, the alchemists, who'd claimed that they could turn lead into gold. And here were Rutherford and Soddy saying that, yes, something like that seemed possible. Rutherford had named the little bits that flew off radioactive atoms alpha particles. He also discovered beta particles. He suspected that alpha particles were actually helium atoms breaking off and escaping like bubbles through a boiling liquid. To test this idea, Rutherford obtained two glass bulbs. One was soap bubble thin and he pumped radon into it. The other was thicker and larger and it surrounded the first. The alpha particles had enough energy to tunnel through the first thin glass shell, but not the thicker second, so they became trapped in the vacuum cavity between the two bulbs. After a few days, this wasn't much of an experiment, since the trapped alpha particles were colorless and didn't really do anything. But then Rutherford ran a battery current through the cavity. If you've ever traveled to Tokyo or New York and looked around at the signs, you know what happened. Helium, like all noble gases, glows when excited by electricity, and Rutherford's mystery particles began glowing helium's characteristic green and yellow. Rutherford basically proved that alpha particles were escaped helium atoms with an early neon light. Rutherford announced the alpha-helium connection during his acceptance speech for the 1908 Nobel Prize. In addition to winning the prize himself, Rutherford mentored and trained 11 future prize winners, the last in 1978, more than four decades after he died. Rutherford later ended up as scientific royalty, too, with his own box on the periodic table, element 104, Rutherfordian. Lord Kelvin's Lasting Impact Lord Kelvin popularized bubble science by saying things like he could spend a lifetime scrutinizing a single soap bubble. That was actually a lie, since according to his lab notebooks, Kelvin came up with the outline of his bubble work one lazy morning in bed, and he produced just one short paper on it. Still, there are wonderful stories of this white-bearded Victorian splashing around in basins of water and glycerin and making strings of interlocking square bubbles. Kelvin's work would inspire bubble science in future generations, too. Biologist Darcy Wentworth Thompson applied Kelvin's ideas about bubble formation to cell development in his hugely important 1917 book, On Growth and Form. 
the modern field of cell biology began at this point. What's more, recent biochemical research hints that bubbles were the cause of life itself. The first complex organic molecules may have formed not in the ocean, as is commonly thought, but in water bubbles trapped in arctic-like sheets of ice. Water is quite heavy when it freezes. It crushes together dissolved impurities, such as organic molecules, inside bubbles. The concentration and compression in those bubbles might have been high enough to fuse those molecules into living cells. Kelvin's work also inspired military science. During World War I, another lord, Lord Rayleigh, took on the urgent wartime problem of why submarine propellers were disintegrating even when the rest of the hull remained intact. It turned out that bubbles produced by the churning propellers turned around and attacked the metal blades the way sugar attacks teeth. These days, physicists interested in alternative energy model superconductors with bubbles. Pathologists describe AIDS as a foamy virus for the way infected cells swell before exploding. Entomologists, st scientists who study insects, know of bugs that use bubbles like submersibles to breathe underwater, and ornithologists, scientists who study birds, know that the metallic shine of peacock's plumage comes from light tickling bubbles in the feathers. Most important, in 2008, in food science, students at Appalachian State University finally determined what makes Diet Coke explode when you drop Mentos into it. Bubbles. The grainy surface of Mentos candy acts as a net to grab small dissolved bubbles, which combine to form larger ones. Eventually, a few gigantic bubbles break off rocket upward and whoosh through the nozzle of the bottle, spurting up to 20 magnificent feet. Clearly, this discovery was one of the greatest moments in bubble science.